This is More Than Before with Nathan Cook. Hey, everyone. I'm so excited for our guest today. She is a crazy, talented woman who chose to leave corporate America to start her own consulting business. She is developing people in their leadership, in growth. She's also working with people in their BS which by the way, uh, this is a PG program. Uh, BS stands for belief system. So when she says that, <laughs> you're going to know it's a belief system. Uh, but she is a certified award-winning coach. She is a teacher, a trainer. She is absolutely spectacular because over the past 30 years, she has expertise in business consulting with an emphasis in leadership and human development. She has a huge heart for her clients. But most of all, she truly is a lifelong learner and she is striving to make herself better, to add value to others. So I'm really excited and I'm honored to have my good friend friend and colleague, Dr. Kimberly Hambrick. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? Oh, Nathan. Wonderful. I was like really excited to know who the guest was going to be. I didn't know who that person was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I had a feeling you were probably going to say that. <laughs> Things have been progressing and moving a lot in your world. What's What have you been working on? What have you been, been, what have you been developing lately? Me. Developing myself. And then when you're in the business of growth and when you do that dirty, messy inside work and it makes yourself better, you want to mm -hmm. help others do that dirty, messy inside work. And it's not easy work, right? It, it's no. work that a lot of people don't want to do, but it's work that needs to be done. Absolutely. And full transparency, I didn't know I needed to do that work <laughs> until the wheels came off the train in corporate mm. and I found myself betting on myself. Tell me a little bit about that. How long has it been since you've been out of corporate? But then I'm also curious, when did you start to realize the wheels were actually coming off? You know, you, you know, you're going down the road and all of a sudden you feel the car start to shake and you're like, eh, that doesn't seem quite right. I don't know what that is. And then you feel like a bump and you're like, ah, oh, that maybe I ate something. And then all of a sudden you <laughs> see the wheel going past and you're going, well, uh, I think we might need to figure something out. Um, what what was that process of coming to that realization? Because I think a lot of people are coming to that right now, at kind of in where we are. There's a lot of companies that are starting to turn over employees that have been there for 30, 35 plus years. And people are starting to feel that vibration, not even just in corporate America, but in their jobs generally. And so I'm curious, what was that feeling or what was that thing that you started to notice and what made you make the jump? It's a, not a pretty tell, but it's a, it's a real tell. Being in corporate, coming up on 30 years, being in leadership roles, probably since the early 90s. And mm. I didn't always get it right. And I kind of knew I didn't always get it right. And I was working on being a better leader. At the same time, I was battling those belief systems that yes. <laughs> swirl in my head of limiting self-beliefs. And I was in my late 40s, early 50s, before I really realized, hey, I'm worth it. And yeah. it was both personal and professional. It was people in my life that should have loved me that didn't, that made me feel less than. And then in the corporate world, when you, at least in my case, Nathan, when I saw myself as less than, I attracted people who saw me as less than. And so mm. I knew that I probably overstayed my expiration date in that position by about mm. two years. And what I mean by that is I stopped growing myself. I stopped pushing myself. I was more focused on, do they like me? Would they be my friend? What can I do for them? Instead of making some of the difficult decisions that needed to be made. So as all that was going on, I learned about Maxwell Leadership having a team. I had been certified as a coach through International Coach Federation about four years prior because I did a lot of coaching in leadership roles. So I joined first and foremost for myself. And I joined in October of 2017 to grow me. Hmm. My first big conference that I was going to for certification was February 2018. And in January 2018, I'm in the office and I'm in a meeting and a lady's talking to me and I'll use you as the person. And we're talking and she said, you know, Nathan's been secretly recording you audio, video and journaling about you for 10 plus years. And she keeps wow. talking. And I'm like, what? 
And she says it again, and she keeps talking. And I said, I have a problem with that. And she said, it's not a problem. I said, what's well, a problem for me? That's when I resigned. And I surprised myself more than anybody that I stood up for myself. Now keeping with the PG podcast, I woke up the next morning and I was like, what have I done? But I knew it was important that I bet on myself. And so two weeks later, I go to the Maxwell Conference. You've been there. I met you there. These amazing people who are fabulous and fantastic. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? I don't do anything. At mm -hmm. that point, I had no idea. And my whole goal was, please, Jesus, don't let me cry. <laughs> That's really where it started. But somewhere along mm -hmm. the line, I realized I was worth it. And it did not matter wow. if the people that were my friends in the corporate world weren't my friends anymore. I was going to make this work. Mm. And what I will say is being in the business for so long and never burning any bridges, there were people who reached out to me when I first stepped out on, in corporate. And they're like, hey, we want to hire you. We want you to do this. We want to do that. And I appreciated it because I needed a little bit of a bridge <laughs> with some income until I grew yeah. some work. Now, I do have one foot back in corporate because the projects that I was associated with for most of my career were coming up again for recompete. And people reached out and said, we want you to write the proposal. And I said, sure. And then they said, we want you to be the director. And it was going to be short term. Hmm. But the woman who was going to replace me had pancreatic cancer and died. Um, and then COVID hit. So I'm looking at a new team in a new organization that knows my reputation, but they don't know me. And they're hmm. hurting. They've lost wow. somebody they worked with for 20 plus years. They're now looking at working from home for the first time in their careers. And oh my goodness, their kids are going to be home. And I, I leaned in and I helped focus them and grow them. And I'm very proud of that work. I'm very proud of what I've done. I still have my business and that's my heart and soul. And I do that. But in a way, I went back into corporate as a different person who believed in herself, but more importantly, grew the people around me. So when mm. I do exit, there's five people who could do what I do 852 times better. You know, what's interesting about that is it took you being physically removed out of the company in order for you to realize that the company wasn't all that you needed. And I think there's so many people today in life that have their identities wrapped up in their job. They have their identities wrapped up in all these different things. And so it was quite a miracle. It was quite a blessing for you to have this happen. You know, obviously it sucks. You've, you've poured in 30 plus years into, into a company and all of a sudden you're, you're finding yourself out of a job and you're around all these people. They're asking you what you do and your entire identity up until this point has been wrapped up in what you do. Mm -hmm. That's, that's who you were. And so all of a sudden, now you go to this Maxwell convention, John Maxwell being one of the foremost authorities on leadership in the world still to this day, but even so back then, you're in this group of people that are super passionate. They're excited about what they're doing. They are going places. They have a vision of what they're doing. And then they ask you, hey, Kimberly, what are you, what are you doing? You're going, uh, bleepity bleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so true. So much of what you said is so true. I think like most people, uh, if I were to tell you years ago who I was, I always used to say if I were to die tomorrow and the only thing I'm known for is a wife and a mother, what a wonderful life. And then life took a turn and I had a scratch off wife. <laughs> but if I'm a mother, and I am a mother. What a wonderful thing to be. But I did anchor myself in my career. I was very aggressive and wanting to get ahead, not in a bad way, but I knew if I were to get ahead, it was up to me. And I was always doing what I needed to do. What was next? What was next? What was next? And so to mm. walk away from it without a plan, without a net was difficult. It was difficult there yeah. in the beginning. And I remember thinking, I can do this. I don't know how to do it. I have no idea how I'm going to do it. Would anybody want to work with me? And that didn't matter because at that point, 
it was up to me to do it. And so then when I go to the Maxwell conference and, and there wasn't a soul in that room who was trying to out me as you got nothing. I found some really good lifelong new friends there in that room mm -hmm. on that first event. But what I will say, Nathan, is that I go to these events, I go back twice a year for me. And when I see and meet new people, I never ask them, what do you do? I always ask them, why did you join? What is it that mm. you want to do with this? Because mm. I never want to put somebody in that spot that I was put in, not intentionally, but yeah. I don't want to do that to other people. So I'm curious, you were, you were talking about childhood. Childhood was not a happy-go-lucky necessarily time in life for you. But, you know, it's interesting, and I know that you've done the work, so I know that I can ask you this question. But a lot of people look at their childhood and they go, oh my gosh, it was absolutely awful. I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with those people, at, you know, cut off, you know, fill in the blank. And I know that for you, you've done a lot of work and you've done a lot of healing in this specific area. So I'm curious for you, as you look back at childhood, who were you when you were a child back then that you now cultivate today because you realize that it wasn't cultivated in you back then, but you know that it was there. Like there was a personality of you. Like I, I know you're sarcastic, you're sassy, you're fun to be around. I imagine that as a young child, you probably had that too, which probably wouldn't work very well with disciplinarian parents. <laughs> but how, how would life be different if that particular piece had been cultivated in you? Some of the, some of the things that really make you who you are today. Such a great question. And I say often, and, and I truly mean this, I have no regrets about anything in my life. I had, from the outside looking in, a happy childhood. But I come from an Italian family. I'm the middle child, and I don't get caught up in a lot of those things. But I was the middle child, older sister, younger brother. And it's funny, because how you describe me now is not how I was as a child. I was the good kid. I didn't make waves for anything. I got straight A's. My mom used to tell me a lot that I wore my heart on my sleeve. And if they told me, boo, I'd go to my room and cry. I was yeah. always trying to make sure everything was okay. Somewhere along the line, I got forgotten about in that I believe, and, and I had a conversation one time, both my parents have passed, but I had a conversation at one point with my mother. And the way she said it to me was, I didn't need to worry about you, but I didn't take it that way. I took it as she didn't love me. I, I did take a lot. I did. It did take a lot of internal work and a lot of healing. And as a person of faith, a lot of praying to get through that. I can say now that my mother did the absolute best that she could do. And I'm okay with that. But one of the things that I will say, Nathan, is... Being blessed as a mother with two children, my boys know daily. And and I told you, they're 26 and 29, soon to be 27 and 30, and they know daily that they're loved. They know mm -hmm. exactly that I'm here for them. We've made it through a couple rough patches, and I knew I was the mother they needed to get through. So I take a lot of pride in that, that... I broke a cycle of a mother that did the best, but I honestly do not recall that woman ever saying to me, she loved me, even when she mm. was in the hospital and sick. And I would go up, race up there to be there. She would tell everybody else in the room and on the phone, she loved them, but she never told me. Mm. And I did a lot of driving and crying from those visits. And at some point, it was driving and crying and screaming out the window of the car. I didn't know how to process it all then. But I can honestly tell you now, she did the best she could. And I am me because of how she was. And I'm okay mm. with that. I love the processing piece about this. And if you're listening to this, I, I, I love Kimberly's story because I think there are so many people that have a similar story to this where they don't have a parent, whether that's, whether that's a father that doesn't tell them that they love them or a mother that doesn't tell them that they love them, or maybe it's both parents where you don't feel appreciated that your parents actually see you or that they communicate to you that you're loved. I find that a lot, that a lot of kids, a lot of 
not even kids, but young adults don't feel connected with their parents. They don't feel like their parents actually care about them. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said, the statement of she did the best that she could. And I think so many times often in life, we see things from our own perspective. We forget that there were things going on in the background that you didn't know about. That doesn't excuse necessarily behavior, but it gives you a better understanding of, man, if I had the same tools that my mother had growing up, I probably would have been the same exact way. But there is something that you that you talk about with this is that you broke the cycle. Mm -hmm. I think so many people right now listening to this could break the cycle, but they're so bitter and they're holding on to the past pieces that they're unwilling to let go of what happened to them to break the cycle. Yes. And so I'm curious, that cycle being broken, you know, for the person that's listening, what would you tell them that, you know, here's the first step that I took it. Maybe it's not a big step. You know, it's not, uh, you know, going and seeing someone, it could just be sitting down and writing. I don't know what that process was for you, but what would be a first step? What was the first step for you as you started to navigate these, you know, tumultuous waters of childhood? One of the things that, that as you were talking, that bubbled up, I, I had to release the feeling of, I, I don't want to use a victim in the way that a lot of people use it, but I had to release this feeling that I wasn't loved for whatever reason, and then fill in the blank, because yeah. that can take us down such a, a windy swirl of a garden path. I had to come to terms with, when I say she did the best that she could, my sister needed a lot more attention for various reasons. My brother, as the only son in the Italian family, could do no wrong. And I just kind of stayed on the surface, not worrying about me, always getting good grades and everything. But it, it, there have there been moments in my life as I was processing that I would think, well, why not me? Of course. I do remember one of those times when I was really trying to not very maturely handle how I was feeling in a conversation with my mother had said, I just feel like if my sister and I are hanging off a cliff, you will save her no matter what. And she never answered. And that one hurt. Hmm. But staying in the hurt, and it doesn't matter what the hurt is, staying in the hurt of when I say that people who should have loved me don't, my parents, my brother and sister, staying in that hurt doesn't serve me. Staying in the hurt of a marriage that ended in divorce. We have two amazing boys. We had our good times, but we have two amazing boys. That doesn't serve me. Staying in the hurt of people in corporate that I was blindsided by, blindsided by somebody who, when I started to dig a little deeper into it, truly had tried to break me personally, mm -hmm. professionally, financially, spiritually, emotionally. And I took away that power by saying, I'm leaving. I wasn't asked to leave. Mm. I said, I'm leaving. And I was told that that person was so surprised. And I couldn't understand why someone would be surprised that I didn't want to be around that type of behavior. Whatever it is, and it's not, and, and please hear me, listeners, I'm not trying to make light of this because it's not easy at times yeah. to do it, but you have to sit and ask yourself, what do I need to release? Mm -hmm. That's holding me back, keeping me stuck, keeping me in the spiral. And once you do that, once you can identify it, you start to find a path forward. It's true, because so many of those hurts are the things that anchor us down where we are. Our unwillingness to let go of things from the past. It's not to say that the person didn't hurt you or that they didn't do something to you, but it's for you to say, I'm going to put this down, this hurt down. And I'm going to walk forward knowing that I can be stronger than this, right? Because you've had so many things happen in your life where your life has truly been this crucible, right? It just continually heats up and you're constantly having to let things go. And you're going, okay, God, like, I think I'm done. I don't think I need any more crucible moments. I don't want the heat anymore. Like, I think I'm good at giving up, you know, everything that I've given up so far. Let's not go anymore. And then God heats things up again. He goes, you know what, Kimberly, I want to make you into something amazing, but you have to be willing to trust me. Trust me to let go. 
And I find that a lot of times people aren't willing to let go of those hurts and those pieces that they're holding on to so they can move forward in their life. One of the things I love about who you've become is you become very intentional of the people that you surround yourself with. And I think it's important. A lot of people don't understand how important the surrounding community that you put around you is because you are around a community. And I don't know if it, whether you knew it at the time when you were being placed in the community of just being around people that cut you down, that didn't believe in you, that didn't encourage you. When you are in that kind of community, your growth is stifled. It's hard mm -hmm. for you. It is next to near impossible for you to shine in the way that God has created you to shine. And so for you, at one point in your life, you started to cultivate. I remember us even being in a conversation once where you said, you know what? I'm cutting these people out. I'm not talking to them anymore. For some people, they go, oh man, that's awful. I can't believe that You know, she thinks she's so much better than anyone. It, no, that's not what it is. Mm -hmm. She realizes that God gave her a specific gift in her life that she has to shine to show love and kindness to others. But in order to do that, she has to surround herself with people that will cultivate that. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was like of shifting the tribe that you're around? Because I think for many people, it's hard, right? Because they have that feeling, that sense of like, I'm abandoning people. Like, oh, well, you know, they're, they're doing the best that they can, even though they're hurting me, they're doing the best that they can. I just don't want to leave them. There are times where you actually need to leave them. What was that process for you to be able to do that? Because right now you're surrounded by some amazing powerhouses that believe in you, that lift you up, and they are seeing you in a different light than even you see yourself. They continually raise the bar for you because they are people of value and quality. How did you start doing that? Because for many people, it is such a hard journey to even start that. It is, and I'll talk about the word release in a moment, but what you're talking about is pruning. So if you want to have a healthy plant, you have to prune away some of the things. Paul Martinelli, one of the mentors uh, in Maxo Leadership early on, on a call with him, and I remember talking about this work situation. And one of the things he said to me, the first thing he said was, I don't understand why God creates people like that, you know, who try to intentionally hurt people. And then he said, you just have to bless and release them to their higher good. And that stuck with mm. me. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a person of simple words. Words mean a lot to me. Bless and release them to their higher good. And as I started to think about that, that meant I'm still wishing them well. I still want to them to succeed. And I'm still going to love them. But I'm going to love them from a distance. They don't have to be at my table. They don't have to be in my life. I'm thankful for the people and the moments in my life that were there for a season but their season has passed. If I'm not thankful for that, that falls into regrets. And I, I said, I don't do regrets. I can, you know, I can, I said earlier that my mom did the best she could, but I felt unloved, but I'm who I am. I'm a strong person. I had to fight mm. for attention. And I've learned to turn that in a better way than how it just sounded. So pruning people, sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's coworkers. I'm in this season of this year, this whole year has been about releasing in a way it's pruning, but it's releasing people, work, thoughts, ideas that aren't serving me. And that might sound mm. very self-centered, but one of the things I will say is it is more than okay to fight for yourself and invest in yourself. and. I appreciate what you said about the people that I have in my inner circle. They are people who support me, lift me up, challenge me, but they also allow me to do that for them. And that's so important mm. to me, Nathan, to have a two-way street. I think in some past situations, I was doing all the lifting and supporting and I was left empty. Mm. And so what did I do? I lifted and supported more because I thought they'll like me. You know, was it Sally Fields? You like me, you like, I just, if I just did enough, somebody would like me. Somebody would mm -hmm. see my value. And as people of faith, I think it was in one of those moments and it was anchored with a situation with our youngest that by the grace of God, we made it through. 
But it was in one of those moments when I held on to my faith very strongly, but I would sit and cry and I would ask one word and that word was why. And it took me a while to realize that that was a weakness on my part if I'm questioning God. And how Mm. this came to realization for me (laughs) was in a professional development training setting where we were to have some quiet time. And I get up from the table, about 40 people and two mentors I greatly value in the room. And we're to have some quiet time. And I get up and I hear booming. It's time. Forgive yourself. Now, I knew whose voice it was. And I just started crying. I had no idea what I was to forgive myself for. And it took me several months And what I realized was it was in those moments when I was questioning him that even though I say my faith is important and my faith brought us through it, I wasn't as faithful as I should have been. And you had mentioned that earlier when we when we let go and we trust in him. If you were to ask me who I am today and how I am, I'm at peace. And this is something that I've really started to live into probably the last month or so. I'm at peace. I, I Do I have everything I want out of life? No. Am I still a work in progress? Absolutely. But I'm at peace with the gifts I've been gifted with. I'm at peace with the knowledge that I know my path forward to help others. And that's more than enough for me. I mean, it's, it's, it's a new feeling, but it's a wonderful place to be in my life, especially as I <clears throat> get a little older. As you, uh, never mind. <laughs> I was trying to think of a, I was trying to think of a, a different way to say that that would that would be better. But uh, then I realized yeah, I was just hey, going to put my foot in my uh, mouth. I am a firm Sometimes believer. Sometimes wisdom is learning when to stop talking. <laughs> I really love that because so many people right now don't have peace. There are so many people around us that do not have peace in their life. And they're looking for a number of different things to find peace in. And so I love that because what most people think is that when you find peace, it's like calm water and you know, you're like in your yoga position and everything is, everything is perfect and nothing goes wrong. It's kind of like when my wife and I, when we were first getting married, I asked her, you know, what do you think love is? And she was like, oh, love is that feeling that you get when you're with someone and nothing ever is wrong. And you never fight and on and on and on. And I was like, okay, wait, time out, time out. I just have to say, um, no, in- wrong, <laughs> incorrect. That's not how it works. <laughs> you're going to be really mad at me and really frustrated with me half the time. And you're going to have to choose to love me. Uh, <laughs> but what's so fascinating about this is that peace does not mean that the storms in your life are going to go away. Peace means that internally, who you are, your understanding of who you are and who you're created to be and the gifts that you've been given, peace is understanding that you're there for a reason and for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And with every single situation that you've been in your life, there was purpose, but there wasn't peace because there was a misunderstanding of who you're created because so many people piled on these identities of this is Kimberly, this is who she is. And so we're going to all treat her this way. And you went, I guess this is who I'm supposed to be. And you allowed people to do that. And Mm -hmm. so you started to shift. You started to change the way that you viewed yourself. And when you did that, the world started to change around you and started to say, well, these aren't my people anymore. These people don't actually see me in the light that I want to be. When it comes to this idea of peace and understanding who you are, within within even the past couple months that you were talking about, how did you progressively get to that peace? Was there was there a practice? Was it something that you were reading? Was it prayer? Was it meditation? What brought you to that peace? Was it a surrendering of the situation to realize, well, you know, stuff's gonna hit. I can't really do anything about it. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna be here in the storm, kind of like I'm going to allow the waves to go around. I'm going to move with the water. What what was that process like for you to gain peace? Because so many people today lack peace and they're looking for peace. They may not even know it, but they, they're they looking for peace. How how did you take that step towards peace? Yeah, I know you're going to ask such difficult questions. Um, <laughs> one thing is that 
when I talk about pruning people, people have pruned me from their life. So let's be real here. I'm, I'm an acquired taste. Not everybody <laughs> likes me or want to be a, around me. And I have to accept that. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. I did not find peace through yoga. <laughs> Honestly, that will never be a way I'm going to find peace. That stresses me out. I, I think it was because of how I've been viewing this year as a transition year. The word that, and I, and I don't really get into the words of the years as much as a lot of people, but for some reason, this word, releasing, has really felt right. And I know that I'm shedding a little bit of things that Maybe I'm doing some work and business with people because I think it's helping them <laughs> versus is it helping me? And my time's limited. All our time is limited. So I want to focus on the things that truly make me happy. And what makes me happy is when other people, you coach people, when they get that aha and when you see that transformation. And that's yeah. powerful, that's powerful. So I think I've been allowing myself more opportunities like that. And I know that if the world changes like it does on a dime, and all I ha if I have to go and work at Walmart because my business isn't working, I'll be happy with that. I, I would be happy with mm. that because it's a lifelong Catholic, but it's taken me a long time to understand. <laughs> that I was truly created for a reason. And that mm. reason is not mine to define. Mm. And so I didn't have peace a lot of times because I was fighting it. I think there was a while about a year ago, the end of last year, I knew I needed, I was being called to do something. I didn't know what it was, but I was being called to it. And patience is not a virtue of mine. I needed you know, to know. It's supposed to be a virtue of yours, right? <laughs> I, I pray for that one daily. I wanted to know what I was supposed to do, and I wanted to see it now. And yeah. these amazing mentors and friends, and I would ask them, what is it I'm supposed to do? And they would all push back and say, well, we can't help you with that. And I was like, oh, that's not the answer. Next, next. And I'm okay with it. Can't you just it. tell me? <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm really okay with it because regardless of if we allow people to speak into our lives, they're going to speak into our lives if we want them to or not. There are still people yeah. that tell me what I need to do and what I'm doing wrong and might think they're being helpful, but they're being hurtful. And, and I can't get caught up in that because I have learned through this process in the last 10 or more years that the two voices are his and mine. Mm -hmm. I don't always get it right, but he does. And that, that just brings me comfort and that brings me peace. So I still want to know what I want to be when I grow up. That's really a question that excites me because I don't mm -hmm. think, I know he's not done with me. And I don't know what it looks like, but for me, I had to let go of the thought that I was in control. <laughs> you weren't in control this whole time? <laughs> uh, I, I was acting like I was in control and I was failing miserably. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think it's interesting, though, because this idea of peace, though, finding the place where... I think a lot of pe people start to find peace when they get to a place where everything seems to be out of control. <laughs> when things get so out of your control and you have to surrender control. I hear some people say surrendering your, your power to you know, surrendering control to a higher power. And, you know, do you and I that how higher power is God, right? You surrender to God because God created you and God has a plan for you and God knows you inside and out and you're fighting, you're running. And so at one point, you pile all this stuff on you, the the BS, and that's both BSs, by the way, not just belief system, <laughs> but you pile those things on your life to the point where all of a sudden you realize that it's completely out of your control. You've got no control. And there's a surrendering that happens. I was just recently talking with someone about how I started doing um, underwater training, so deep in fitness training. Um, and one of the things that you have to learn how to do is be under the water, holding your breath with weights, mm -hmm. like walking across the pool with weights. 
And there's a moment where you get under the water and you go, oh no, oh, 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 oh. And how do you get peace is you, you let go. You stop fighting it. You relax and you move yeah. with it. And, and, and peace isn't necessarily accepting everything that's going on. You know, you want to make changes. You want to, you want to try and make some difference in the situation that you're in. But there's also this piece of not controlling everyone else and every other part mm. of the situation. It's, it's about controlling who you are and how you're showing up. Yeah. And I think that's what's really, really cool about where you are right now is you're realizing that, that you no longer have to try and force these other people to do what you want. You, you no longer have to put yourself in these little peg holes. You just go, this is who I am. Take, take me or leave me. Right. Mm -hmm. Now I, I so love that. And one of the things throughout all of this, um, as I, as I've been on my personal growth journey and it's really a lifestyle, it's, it's living fully out who I am created to be in all areas of my life. I had to learn that when that negative thought bubbled up or when somebody would say something to me, I, I use this one often because I think it was, it is the absolute funniest cold call message ever on LinkedIn. A person who reached out to me and said, and I quote, I help older women like you look better in makeup. <laughs> So many things wrong with that. And I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to sell well. I don't know why. Just, there's something inside of me, even as a guy, I, I feel like it's not going to go over well for whoever sent this. And, and I just <laughs> wanted to say, sign me up. You've, you've won my heart. But anytime things like that happen or things bubble up, it's really a quick process and it's a simple process. I, I have a hashtag simple yet profound because I'm not, you know, a highly intelligent person here in my life. Yeah. The thought bubbles up. Is it true or not? Yes or no. If it's mm -hmm. not, bless and release it. If it's true, then I still have another question or an action. Do I want to do something with it? Yes or no? Mm. Just because something's true doesn't mean I need to change it. If I'm not hurting anybody, if I'm not breaking the law, if I'm okay with it, just because somebody else doesn't like it doesn't mean I have to change it. And I'm going to tell you, that's not how I lived my life, my first 40 plus years. Not at all. Someone would tell me, that I was doing something wrong or growing up, I was known as Kimmy. So just added myself now and I'm sure I'll hear it from you. But uh, Kimmy, did you really want to wear that when you go out? Oh, of course not. No, I'll go change. Mm. Um, did you really want to do this with your life? No, I'll go do this. I, I had no voice. I felt like whatever people were saying into me, it had to be true. Mm. And I am forever grateful and thankful that I'm not there anymore. And it really was one of the mentors, Mark Cole. So I joined um, 2017 before I exited corporate and I joined, bought into mentorship. And that very first call with Mark after <laughs> IMC, you forget that these calls are recorded. Mm -hmm. People are hearing you. <laughs> and I it's cried. not just you and the other person. No, yeah. <laughs> I cried and said a word, cried and said a word, cried and said, I mean, it was, it was ugly. It was ugly. And one of the things that Mark said, and I've heard Mark say this to other people, what he said to me is borrow the belief I have in you until yours matches. And I have to tell you, Nathan, no one, ever, ever said anything like that to me that impacted me that greatly. And I held on to it. And I remember running into him about six months later. And I went up to talk to him and he's like, I see it. I'm like, you see what? He said, I see your belief matches mine. And I remember talking to him another time about that. And he brought it up again. I said, you talk to all these people, far more important than me. 
and yet you remember that. And he said, I do. I remember it because you were broken. And Mm -hmm. he said, I watched the potter put you back together. So for people to see the work that I know I've done on the outside, not that I need external validation, but that felt really good. And because somebody invested and believed in me, I have to pay it forward. That's Mm. why I do what I do. That's why you do what you do, because there's that moment where somebody believed in you and flipped the switch. And that's why we do this. What an amazing gift. What an amazing gift this is. I hope that you're catching what Kimberly's talking about here, because this is really important. So many people do not think about the people that they're telling their story to. And for so many years, Kimberly told her story to people who didn't value her, people that didn't see value in her, people that could care less about whether she was successful or whether she would grow. And she came to a point in her journey where she finally was in front of someone and they looked at her and they said, I see you. I see you borrow my belief in you because I think you're amazing because I love you because there's value in you. And I, I, I want you to see what I see. And it was, it was for the first time in her life that someone actually heard her, heard her heart crying out. And I, and I hope you hear this, that there are people in your life that you will tell your story to, you will tell your dreams to, and they are going to crush it. And it's not because every single person wants to crush your dreams because they don't know how to care for your dream. That's why you need someone like a Mark Cole in your life or a Kimberly in your life or Nathan in your life that hears those things that guards them and protects them. And they say, you know what? I believe in this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a difficult road, but I, I know you can do this. And so I hope you, I hope you hear this because this is such a powerful lesson that I hope each and every one of you can can walk away with guard your dreams tell them to people who will guard them with you that doesn't mean that you want people that won't say no and won't bring some reality to the situation right we need those people in our lives for the dreamers to keep our feet on the ground so we don't float away with a bunch of balloons right there is an important aspect of having reality in your life but you do need someone who can cover you and say you know what i see who you are this is who you are And believe me when I tell you this, this is who you were created to be. And I think that's what's fascinating about this. I think every person needs to have someone in their life that they can confide in. A coach is a really great opportunity to do that. That's why it's important to find a good coach that will create a safe space where you can share those things. And that was what was great about what she just said. She was on a call with hundreds of people, (laughs) barely able to get a word out, two words out at a time through tears. And she was with someone in a community that cared and lifted her up. And I think that's the power of finding a community that can see you, that can help you to grow. Your journey has been so amazing. In fact, I love that. uh, I'm pretty sure it was very shortly afterwards, you started a podcast. Uh, (laughs) The woman who had no voice and no confidence in who she was decided to start a podcast, the Cannoli Coach podcast. Uh, where you help listeners with resources, strategies to implement in their life. And here's what I love about what you say with this. You say to help them leave their frustration and take the cannoli. <laughs> we we need to do that though. We we need to leave the frustrations out and we need to we need to get back to the simplistic pieces of life, just the small things in life that make things better, like a really good cannoli. Yeah. Yes and amen. I I so agree. Um, Yeah, it cracks me up sometimes when I hear people (laughs) talk about that because I did do that. I'm like, who is that person who did that? Not knowing. You're still doing it, though. It's it's, it's, still still doing doing the podcast. Yeah, I know. I'm still doing it. I'm very proud of it. And I love bringing guests on. You were one of the first ones. And I, I do it because I love talking with people and hearing their stories. I thrive mm-hmm. on that. But it started as, so I'm, I'm stepping out on my own. I'm going to be at that point, I was one of 20 some thousand coaches 
trained in Maxwell yeah. leadership. What makes me different and unique? And this crazy idea while I was mowing grass, because that's where I think <laughs> behind the lawnmower, <laughs> um, <laughs> was I'm going to start a podcast. Didn't know the first thing about a podcast. And some could say I still don't know the first thing about a podcast, but I don't care. I love it. And then it's like, how am I different? I'm Italian. I like cannolis, the cannoli coach. And then an idea was born. And then I butchered butchered the line from the godfather i know each and every time i say that my dad is just looking down at me shaking his head in disgust but <laughs> I, I but i'm okay with that that really puts yourself out there you're doing a podcast it puts yourself out there but what it does is and something that i learned was if my voice only reaches one person that's the person mm. it needed to hear needed to hear that voice. And I let go of the, am I good enough? What would people think? I am quirky. I am unscripted. Sometimes I, I snort when I laugh. I mean, a really good laugh, I snort. These are good things. And this is what you get with me. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. And I wouldn't have been okay with it years ago. I would mm -hmm. never have put out a podcast where I worried about what other people thought. And, and the funniest thing, Nathan, is that when the first episode or two came out of the podcast, somebody that I had worked with in corporate for about 20 years reached out to me and said, we're worried about you. <laughs> I said, who's worried about me? We all are. Y'all haven't talked to me in three months, but four months, but now you're, and I, what are you worried about? And they're like the cannoli coach. And I'm like, I know it's exciting. And I mean, I was loving it. And then it dawned on me. This person thinks when I write proposals and do work with corporations, I call myself the cannoli coach. <laughs> and I'm like, you understand it's a podcast, right? I, I, I don't go into a corporation, but I couldn't resist then. I said, but if somebody wants to hire the cannoli coach, <laughs> I will show up, do the best coaching training they want, and there will be cannolis at the end. And the but person that's who stopped, you are. Like, yeah, that's what's that's so amazing me at about my core. it. You you owned it. And I think I think that's such a powerful lesson that so many people could learn is that you have to own your quirkiness, who you are, because no one else is going to. And you were created for this. You were created for this exact purpose, this exact point in life. Because so many people are like Kimberly early on, where they're shielding themselves and they can't be vulnerable because they're around a bunch of people that they can't be vulnerable with. At some point. When you start to take off some of the layers of armor, people are going to attack you, but you have to realize that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. They don't understand because they themselves are afraid of who they are. And so when you step out and actually be who you were created to be, they attack that because guess what? They're not living in the way that they were created to be. Absolutely. And that's what I love. That's what I love about the cannoli coach because it truly is you. Kimberly, I want to thank you so much for being on this program because it truly is eye-opening to hear someone's journey. You know, so far this season, we've had some amazing people that are on just like you, but they've had a different childhood. You know, a lot of them have had up childhoods. Things were good. And I want people to understand that you don't always have to have a great childhood in order to have success. You don't even have to have a great like high school or young adult life, right? You can always change things around. And so yeah, I, I love this about your story. It's never too late to start mm -hmm. living into the person that God created you to be. So I, I want to thank you for being transparent, to show up, to tell your story. I want to ask you one more question here, but before I do, I really want to encourage that if you're listening to this right now and Kimberly is striking a chord with you, I want you to go on Facebook and I want you to find Kimberly Hambrick Consulting and I want you to reach out to her. I want you to connect with her because you need someone in your life. You need someone that's going to be there to walk you through these pieces. And she's an excellent coach and trainer to be able to walk you through this. She has gone down the path from where you are. She's continuing to grow. And guess what? 
you want someone that's going to be there to walk with you, not a year, 12 years ahead of you, but someone that has come out of it and it's still going, hey, I want to work with you. I want you to be transparent. I want to be able to believe in your dreams. And so I want you to go over, find Kimberly, and also make sure you go to her podcast, The Cannoli Coach. You can find it on any major streaming platform. So go and follow, take a listen to her podcast. It's great. Um, You always make me laugh. Here's what I want to ask you, Kimberly. You know, when we first met, I felt like there was a lot of uncertainty in your life. And I think that there there definitely was a period <laughs> of time where you were starting to step out, right? You you were you were in these shadows and now you're starting to step out into who God really created you to be, to be doing something that you were meant to be doing your entire life that no one spoke life over. And today I believe your confidence is evident in the way that you show up. There is a confidence there that was not there before. What does it look like for someone to step out in confidence because confidence is such a a tricky subject matter for some people. How did you build your confidence to be able to step out to do things that maybe other people attacked at first, like the cannoli coach or walking away from corporate America? How did you build confidence to be able to step forward? Such a good question. (laughs) You had me crying. You have me thinking. I don't know what to do now. Um, I just haven't but, made you snort yet. <sighs> but I appreciate that you talk about my confidence and you see it. What I will say is there are people who have been in my life. for. I, mean, I have friends, dear friends from junior high and high school. And that's a long, long time time ago and they're my best friends they're my dearest friends and I have so I have lifelong friends I grew up with I have lifelong friends from that period and I have new lifelong friends and that's just an amazing place to be but I've heard from people who knew me before and they said you know you're the same but you're different Hmm. and to me that helps with my confidence because I didn't want to be a different person. I wanted to be me. And people, there were there were people who saw the kernels of me and loved me warts and all. I usually say the good, bad, and ugly. That still see that they see the work I've done, mm. and they see how I speak into them, and they still see me and. I had a conversation with somebody who reached out, somebody that I did work with, you know, really exciting educational research project that I did about 25 years ago. I'll bore you on another episode on that one. And he reached out and we were talking and he had said, I knew back when I met you, you always cared for people and you wanted the best in them and you're still the same person. And that Mm. just... That really touched me. Confidence is owning your story, all of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly, not walking in shame, not hiding. There were times in my life, Nathan, where I did everything I could to avoid a spotlight because I thought if somebody shined a light on me, boy, they were going to see it all. And it wasn't always good. So confidence is owning all of that, not living in it, but owning it, and then becoming who you were created to be. I I don't know how else to describe it other than before all of this internal work, I was very successful, but I was sort of a fraud, and I was doing things for the wrong reason. And now I know in my heart why I'm doing what I do. I know that I'm adding value. I know that I'm doing good. And that doing good could be one person who reaches out and asks me a question and I help them think through something. That means more to me than the millions and millions of dollars that I brought in in corporate. And I recently went on a transformation trip where I went to Panama. And I know you've been on one of those, haven't you? You were on an earlier one. So you know, seeing that little seed of growth, 
I, I had no idea how much I was going to be transformed by that. We're blessed to do this. We are blessed to do this. And that mm. makes me happy. And when you're happy, you're confident. I love that so much. You know, so often on this podcast, I, I try to remind people, and you'll hear me say it, and it sound, it, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it's so true that we have become human doings. We are so focused on what we need to do. We need to, oh, we need to go and do this, and we need to do that, and we need to earn this, and we need to make that, and we got to get the car, and we got to make the money, and fill in the blank. We are so focused on activity that we have completely forgotten who we are. We've forgotten who we were created to be. You know, as you were talking, you reminded me of uh, an interaction I had actually uh, with someone a number of years ago. And she was telling me that, man, I just, I just feel like I, I can't show my imperfections because how is that going to help anyone? Hmm. I need to be strong and I need to stand up and that's what courage is. And that's, confidence of not showing weakness. And I said, you know, what's really interesting is the picture that I have in my mind that comes to mind is a person that's covering themselves. They're covering all the holes in their body. They're trying to hide the imperfections. God looks at that and God says, I'm trying to shine through you. And if you would only take your hands off of your body, you would allow me to shine through your life and to impact and affect people you're not going to make an impact in people's life because you're so amazing. And because you're perfect, you will make an impact on people's life because they will see your imperfections and they will see God shining through those imperfections that you're loved, that you love others and that you're okay, that you're not perfect. Cause guess what? Mm -hmm. No one is, no one is perfect buttercup. <laughs> and so I love this about your story because truly you, you took this exactly where I always love to take it, which is, I want you to understand listening right now, you have to own you. No one else is going to tell you this is who you are. No one told Nathan who Nathan was. No one told Kimberly who Kimberly was. She had to do the digging. I had to do the digging. You are going to have to do the digging. Because even the most intentioned people that have great words to speak over you, that does not always mean that that is what God is speaking mm. over your life. That's and so, so you have to understand that it comes back to you and God and allowing God to speak to you. And that could be reading his word. That could be praying. That could be writing and journaling. That could be different depending on who you are. But I want to encourage you to do what she's saying, to do the hard work. It's not easy. But mm. when you do the hard work, it is definitely going to bring benefits to every single person that you get to impact on the smallest level to the largest level. Kimberly, thank you so much again for being on the podcast. I know so many people listening right now are massively growing. They're understanding the importance of their story to be transparent, to understand that they don't have to be perfect, that where they are is where they are and wherever they go, they are going to be there. And so they need to work on themselves <laughs> just as much as you have. And so I really do want to thank you for being on so much. For those of you that are listening right now, I, I want you to keep your eye out for the next episode. Remember to share, like, subscribe. Someone in your life needs to hear this episode because she has truly poured out some amazing life lessons. So until next time, be more, see more, experience more together.